When Rafael Nadal became world number one in August, it marked the fulfillment of a lifetime ambition. The Spaniard had spent a record-breaking 160 weeks as the world number two, but after beating Roger Federer in the final of the French Open and Wimbledon, his ascent to the very top of men's tennis became inevitable. On arrival in Madrid, where he is playing his first ATP event as the world number one, Nadal received a trophy to mark his achievement. While his peers queued up to pay tribute to the greatest player on the planet. What I always just hoped for is that somebody gets to number one by, by winning, not by me being injured or losing, you know, and I think that's, maybe I was a little bit sick at the beginning of the season and I couldn't put up the fight, maybe I usually put up, but I was not the French Open Finals, I was not the Wimbledon Finals, and it really, that's what he, he had to do to become number one in the world, and he was able to do it, and I think that's why he deserves to be number one and he's played great this season. Yeah, it was, it was actually interesting, you know, around the clay court season he was sort of, um, I guess, accepting that he was going to become number three. Djokovic was playing so well, he had so many points to defend over the clay court stretch and, you know, there was a lot of talk of him, you know, dropping down a little bit and then, you know, he had, again, incredible clay court run, proved that he's probably the best clay court player ever um, this year and then to win Wimbledon in that final was, you know, would give anybody confidence. I guess in a year when you win Roland Garros, Wimbledon and Olympic Games, you know, together with all other ATP titles, is you know, it would be strange to see him still behind Roger, so he, he fully deserved it. Nadal first served notice of his talent in 2002, when he became only the ninth player in the Open era to win an ATP match before he had turned 16. A year later in Monte Carlo, he played his first ever Master Series event and the teenager was starting to make a name for himself. Well, I heard when he was seven, eight years old, he was one of the best in Spain and even the best of the world. So uh, uh, at such a young age, you, you realize that he has something different because uh, all the kids can play well, like, can hit the ball well, but he, he must have something different. And, and mentally, already he was uh, unbelievable, such a great fighter and a winner. And, and uh, that was the first time uh, when I heard of him. He was seven, eight years old, and we started to practice together when he was 13, 14 years old. Honestly, I don't quite remember hearing like Rafa was going to be this super talent, you know, like you hear some other players, you know, when they're young. And because he never, I think, won a junior Grand Slam. So this is really when you hear, um, you know, a talk about the junior. Rafa came uh, through this sort of Spanish school. They play satellites and futures and little tournaments of, on the, of the men's tour pretty early in their career. But once I, I saw I was going to play him, I knew he, he was a good player, but I didn't know how, how well yet. Well, I remember playing him first time in Doha. It was, uh, well, I can't remember now the year, but he was ranked around 45, 50. And I won, I remember I won in the third set and after the match I was saying to my coach, I mean, def defense of this guy is just incredible. And, and that was just the beginning, of course. I mean, now I realize, you know, that his defense back then was already phenomenal. And the thing that he improved a lot, of course, it's his, his offensive game and, and, and he serves. So, yes, I mean, he climbed, climbed up really quickly. In 2004 in Miami, Nadal played his first match against Roger Federer, in which the Spaniard won in straight sets. They would go on to play each other again on 17 occasions, including the epic Wimbledon final in July. The Nadal-Federer rivalry has defined the very sport. No, absolutely, and I think we've had some really fair and cool battles over the years. Um, there's always a few that stand out most, you know, especially the ones in the finals where we played over five sets, like in, in Rome, in, uh, in Wimbledon twice, in Miami once as well. So I think we've really also lived up to the expectations, you know, because it's not always easy to fill, you know, you know make everybody happy, really, because they, they come and see a final and they expect five sets, then sometimes you get a finals like we had in Paris where he just dominates me and you're like, what happened, you know, what was wrong, but you get days like these as well. Yeah, 
I think it's great. Uh, and they, they get along well together and I think they're good friends and uh, so it's even more surprised, you know, uh, than on court. Uh, I guess they want to kill each other, but uh, I think it's great for tennis, it's great for sport. All their matches are, are great, you know, very entertaining and, and it, you know, it's a great show to, to watch a uh, match between, between both. It's better than anything that, that's going really in golf than Tiger and Phil. And I think it's going to go down as, as one of the greats with the, the McEnroe Borg or, or Connors and Borg and, and any of those other rivalries. I think it's going, to be, uh, it's going to be up there of all time. 2005 was Nadal's real breakthrough year. He beat Guillermo Correa in the final of the Monte Carlo and Rome Masters Series. After which Correa declared Nadal was the best clay court player in the world. Later in the year, he won the Rogers Cup in Montreal, defeating Andre Agassi and, in the process, confirming he was more than just a clay court specialist. Today, after becoming the first player since Björn Borg to win the French Open and Wimbledon titles in the same year, he's the complete player. I really think he's, he's turned into a complete player and uh, it's, it's a credit to someone who was already near the top of the game in, in so many aspects to still try to improve and he's done that and, uh, and shown why he he's deserves to be number one in the world now. The, the, the difference between now and, and 10 years ago is that the fast courts are not fast this anymore. The grass is not grass what it was before so it, it definitely does help his game. But, uh, you know, he, he proved to everyone that he can play on any surface and, you know, he's just really complete player. He, he has been improving everywhere. He, he believed when he was young that uh, he could win Wimbledon and, 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 you know, we were not laughing, but, uh, okay, he's a kid, you know, he, <laughs> he thinks everything is possible, but uh, he believed that and, and I think that's why he won. With two Grand Slams, three ATP Masters Series and Olympic Gold, it's been an incredible year for Rafael Nadal. He's almost certain to end the year as the world number one, and there is no one, not even his arch-rival Roger Federer, who would argue with that. The question now, how long can the 22-year-old maintain such dizzying heights? Well, I guess that's a big question now, you know. I mean, he's been number two for, for a very long time. Now he's number one, now he's the one that's being chased and who was supposed to win every tournament he enters, you know, and he's not allowed to lose in the first round because if the number one falls, it's always bigger news than when the number two falls. So we'll see how he handles that. Yeah, well, I think his, his advantage is, uh, well, he's, I, I think he's always going to be the best clay court player, uh, especially for the next four or five years until someone else maybe comes along. But, uh, you know, so he's sort of got those ranking points almost in the in the bag before the, the year starts and it just, you know, depends if he can continue his, you know, form on grass, uh, I guess. He plays always very solid on hard courts, but, um, you know, he's done great on grass the last few years. If he keeps that up, then there's no reason why he can't stay there for, for a few more years. I have no idea. Uh, obviously, all of us being competitors of his want to want to knock him off there and we want to we want to get to that position. But Obviously, Roger's got the closest uh, closest uh, reach to him, but uh, you can't really count Roger out. You can't count Rafa out. They're they're going to go down as two of the greats of all time. So it's going to be fun watching and, and seeing uh, how Rafa deals with being number one and, and how he deals with the pressure and if he can handle it the way Roger has handled it for so long. 2008 has very much been Rafael Nadal's year. He faces many challenges in the future, but the titles, the accolades, and that unique Nadal intensity are set to continue.